25 years ago, on Friday, May 31st, 1985, a tornado packing 400 km an hour winds roared in from West Luther, ran down the entire length of the second line east into the town of Grand Valley. Behind me is the new library that was built when the library was demolished during that tornado. The library was built in 1913. Upper floor was the library and down below was the municipal office. The tornado proceeded east on Amaranth Street creating great destruction in its path. 65 homes were destroyed beyond repair. Several dozen more were seriously affected by the wind and had to be repaired. Behind me is the home of Doug Hunter where Doug's aunt Matilda McIntyre was killed. Another person, Barry Wood, was also killed at the west edge of Grand Valley. In this DVD, you will be shown the homes on Amaranth Street and surrounding streets that were destroyed as they looked before the tornado hit them and as they looked after the tornado struck and some of the new pictures of the new homes. You'll also be hearing the first hand accounts from the actual people that were involved in the disaster itself and the eventual cleanup. Photographs cannot truly convey the heart-wrenching scene of destruction that was left behind. One reporter described walking down Amaran Street as walking through hell. There were nine homes destroyed that were never replaced nor was the Orange Lodge replaced. Three of the oldest churches, all built before 1900, were destroyed. When the tornado reached town, it was as dark as night and all the street lights had come on. Most homes on the outer fringes of the tornado path had to at least have their roofs and windows replaced. While some homes may appear to be repairable, their structures were twisted to the point where they had to be torn down. We will now follow the path of the tornado, traveling west to east. Here we are at Carl and Gail Montgomery's farm, the first property to be hit in East Luther Township. On the south side of the second line between 21 Side Road and the West Luther Town line is the farm owned by Carl and Gail Montgomery. They lost their barn and had it rebuilt by Mennonites. Carl and Gail still live here. On the south side of the second line between 27 and 24 side roads was the farm of Barry Gibson. Both house and barn were destroyed. Mr. Gibson rebuilt both house and barn but later moved away from the area. On the north side of the second line was the new home of Bell and Glenna Hunt which was destroyed. Bill and Glenna rebuilt this house. Glenna now lives at 112 Amaranth Street East in Grand Valley. This house is original to the property and was owned in 1985 by Frank and Carolina Wilson. Today they live next door in the house that was built by Mr. Wiggins. On the road in front of the Wilson home was where the body of Barry Wood was found. The owners of this home in 1985 were Norma and Colin Wiggins. Their home was destroyed and they built this one that looks very similar to the one it replaced. The original home which sat much closer to the road was destroyed. It was owned by Paul and Angie Walker who had the new house built. The cement block house that was here in 1985 was owned by George Labatt and was destroyed. Mr. Labatt sold the vacant lot to Mr. Rose and he built this bungalow. The owners of this home in 1985 were Murray and Heather Ritchie. This home was destroyed and they replaced it with a new one. 
The white portion of the barn was built in 1944. A new section was added at the east side of the barn in 1969. The barn was demolished and not rebuilt. Ray and Elner Ritchie were living here at the time of the tornado. This bungalow replaced the farmhouse on the 50 acre farm. Mike and Cindy Stagg's home was destroyed. The Sloat's home was destroyed. Many people will remember this home as being the home of Ron and Jan Cook. This house was owned by Harvey and Lena Robson. It is one of the oldest homes in Grand Valley. It received minimal damage during the tornado. This house was the object of much picture taking after the tornado, as it had a square metal shovel firmly and flatly embedded into its aluminum siding above the window on the west side of the house. This house is notable in the history of Grand Valley. It was owned in 1886 by John McIntyre and was then located on the west side of Main Street, approximately in the center of the block about where the Mac store is now located. It was there that some of the prominent businessmen met in 1886 and decided to change the name of the town from Luther Village to Grand Valley. This is the home of Charlie Snyder and Myrna Roberts. It was destroyed by the tornado. Charlie built the house himself with a pre-cut lumber kit that he purchased from Viceroy Homes. Charlie and Myrna still live here today. At the time of the tornado, this entire lot was a stand of pine trees. The tornado destroyed all the trees. After this, Rice Riley built this new home. The house that sat on this property was owned by Coram Hustler. It was destroyed by the tornado. Mr. Hustler sold the lot to Ray Flanagan, and Mr. Hustler stayed in Grand Valley, moving into River Hill subdivision. This house is a tornado replacement home. The house was owned by the Sconspies, who had purchased it from John Barry in the early 1980s. The house, instead of being torn down, was purchased by Ralph Brisley, who had it moved to his property in West Luther. At the time of the tornado, this property was a vacant lot. The house was built in 1986 by then local builder John Kimlin. This new house replaced the red brick home that was owned by Ruth Hunter. Mrs. Hunter sold the lot. This is my home in 1985. I had to build a new home after this one was destroyed. The garage was completely gone. I never did find any remnants of the garage itself or any of its contents, except the horse which is on the front of the garage. I found seven years later, where I now live at 67 Amaranth Street East, between my house and the Grand River in the long grass. At the time of the tornado, this property was owned by Rick Rurda. The Rurdas sold the lot to Martin Saunders, a local builder who built this home. This is one of the many square brick homes that stood on Amaranth Street before the tornado. There were 15 homes of this type on the street. Five remain today. This is still the original home to this property. Many will remember it as being owned by Alfred and Sarah Platt. It was built by Art Blair. This is the original house that was built by Wick and Marge Montgomery in the 1960s. This is the original house on this property. The garage was replaced following the tornado. This is the original house on this property, owned by Bruce and Darrell Ritchie in 1985. The brick on the exterior of this house was new following the tornado repairs. This house is new from the foundation up. It was owned by Carl and Ruth Hillis. Its appearance is much the same as the original home. Ruth Hillis still lives here today. They also lost a large garage, which was located on the north side of their home. The house was owned by Paul and Marilyn Calloway in 1985. 
and they had the house built that stands here today. This house was owned by the Willems family in 1985, and they had this new house built after the tornado twisted their house beyond repair. They still live here today. This picture of the old home was taken approximately 1960. Norman Betty Service owned this home at the time of the tornado. This is the original house on this lot. Many people remember it as the Ernie Fripp home. Casey Rackers owned this building in 1985. It was formerly owned by Wayne Eastham for a tire shop. This original home was owned by the Brackens and was destroyed, and the lot was sold to make a larger building lot for number 30 on Amaranth Street. This is the original house owned by Wayne Eastham. At the time of the tornado, Mark Boswell lived here. This property was owned by Casey Rackers in 1985 known as Casey's Auto Body. The original frame building was formerly the stable for the Dominion Hotel, which stood on the site where the site on half now stands. Vince's Restaurant owned in 1985 by Vince Ferry. This building is original to this site. It once served as a gas station owned by Wolf Churnside. Built in 1921, the monument itself was not damaged but the surrounding trees were destroyed. A grant from the Ontario Horticultural Society paid to have the grounds professionally landscaped in 1986. The first thing was the library. There was a, a child buried and a librarian buried. Then there was a death at the north, at the east end of town, west end of town, both sides, pronounced them dead. Then we had a lot of uh, serious injuries, uh, fractured hips, internal injuries, a lot of bleeding, a lot of a lot of wounds, a lot of uh, uh, lacerations. For 50 years I've operated an amateur radio. In many cases our, our work is in emergency. Early in the evening we set up a radio station in the arena on the second floor and for the next seven days we operated that station. But later in the evening we realized that the farmers didn't have the equipment to milk their cows for instance. So we spent the rest of the night right through until after midnight contacting amateurs across southern Ontario and asking them to find generators. And they brought them up the next night. In fact, some of them came up during the night so that the farmers could have it. This house just north of the Cenotaph is original to the site and was owned by Orm and Willa Benham in 1985. It required extensive repairs. This original home, owned by Mike and Janice Walsh, was destroyed. They had this new bungalow built. This cancelled check of Janice Murnahan Walsh's was found at Big Bay Point, 108 kilometers northeast of Grand Valley after the tornado, and was mailed back to her. This house is original and did not sustain any major damage. The tornado destroyed the original church, the adjoining parish hall, and the second floor apartment. The original church was built in 1880 on land donated by Sam Stuckey. Mr. Stuckey also donated the land for the Anakin Cemetery, which is located further up the road on the west side. I don't think uh, everybody will remember that the medical center actually, the roof was taken off it, and I remember cleaning out the medical center and we moved it up to the arena into the to the board old boardroom in behind the snack bar and uh, seeing the people come in uh, for treatment uh, the following week and not only for bangs and bruises but mentally too and uh, that was um, that was pretty touching seeing some of your strongest people um, having trouble and I don't think we could we'll ever forget that
This home was owned by Ray and Wanda Chambers. On the left is Ray Chambers with neighbor Orm Benham. At the time of the tornado, this was a vacant lot directly north of the library. The Carnegie Library was built in 1913. The library occupied the upper floor and the municipal office was on the bottom. Something, I don't know, I was, it, was, it was just so terrifying because I had no idea what was happening and I, I just hit the floor just seconds before that uh, tornado hit the library dead on. Uh, when I came to, uh, I was completely buried in the rubble. My husband and my son got there after they had, they had uncovered my upper uh, body, but I was still trapped with my hips and I, I lost um, feeling in my legs because the, the beam laying across my back cut off the circulation. Before they uncovered me too, the firemen were there and they, they, were, they kept calling at me, where are you, where are you, and I'm like, <laughs> I couldn't, I just kept, you know, yelling at them, but they were walking on top of the, uh, the rubble and so they, they were walking on top of me and uh, the weight, was, it, it was just, the pain was incredible. The little Moore girl uh, was up there. I forget her age now. It's just a youngster. Somehow she'd been protected by uh, the way the lumber and things flew around her, so she had a, a protective wall. But then I looked around the village and it was a mess, a real, real mess. Uh, the house next to me, the back wall had been sheared off, the beds were still made, the wardrobes, stuff on the dresser was still on the dresser, but there was no back wall at all. My little truck I had had rolled onto her lawn, along with all the rubble, of course. This home was built by merchant William Dawson in 1875, later home of John Watt and Ivan Bruce, where the Grand Valley telephone system was located. It is now part of Heinz Foods parking lot. This was the commercial brick building that once was home to the Wind and Weather Insurance Office. At the time of the tornado, this building was owned by Les Canabet and being rented as a residence. It was destroyed beyond repair. It is now part of Heinz Foods parking lot. This property was owned by Kathleen Beckett. The house was destroyed beyond repair. The previous owner of this lot was Jim and Lola Small. After 25 years, this is still a vacant lot. This house is original. It sustained minimal damage. I have a store, a grocery store, right in the centre of the main street. Mm -hmm. I was actually on the telephone when uh, it went dead and the lights went out and then there was complete darkness and, well, uh, all I could say is just all hell broke loose then. You, to just the noise, breaking glass, and uh, it was just terrific in the main street. You couldn't see a thing. The tornado hit the United Church on King Street. It eventually had to be torn down. The old one had been built in 1896. This house was repaired and the Johnsons continued to live here. In 1985, Kim McEwen lived in this house. Kim sold the lot 
The lot had been vacant for 22 years following the tornado. This new house was built for Merv and Ann McPherson in 2007. The owner of 1985 was John and Laura Wolf. Their house was destroyed and they had to build a new one. Pictured are John and Sarah Jane Hillis, owners of the original home. At the time of the tornado, Lynn Hamilton owned the property. Paul McKinney built the new home. The home of John and Barb LaDuke was destroyed. The LaDukes rebuilt and still reside here today. This home was spared. This home owned by Jeed Boggs was also spared. Stu and Susan Bockwell's home was destroyed. They rebuilt the present house. This home was destroyed and the lot was sold to the Harvester's hockey team. Len Frith, the manager of the team, had the house built with many donations. It was sold and the proceeds went to the hockey team. Owner Jesse Mann had this new home built. Standing in front of the home are Bob and Blanche Wittes, who rented the home in the late 1960s. In 1985, this home was owned by Bob Witten. It was destroyed. Derwood Greenwood's home was repaired. The owner of this home in 1985 was June Armstrong. She had the new home built. The original house was built for Dr. Berwick in 1913, where he lived and had his medical practice. This stone house, owned by John and Marlene Black, was spared. This home of Harry and Levina Hillis was also spared. Elmer Firth on the right and Joe Firth on the left watching the house being torn down. Diane Downey had this house built after the tornado and she still lives here. This is the Orange Hall that had been built in 1881. Today it's the parking lot for the Church of Christ next door. The original church that sat on this property was built in 1892. We got to think about uh, the great job that the uh, emergency services uh, did at the time. The fire department, they, they were just phenomenal. The rescue, uh, a lot of people will forget. Uh, that the fire department in Grand Valley, they were raising money at that time uh, to build a new fire hall. They've got one since, but at that time they had raised a lot of money and uh, they donated their money that they had raised to that point to the emergency relief fund to get matching dollars.
This house was built on existing basement walls. It was the first home occupied following the tornado. This property was owned by Louis Brissette in 1985. This house was demolished and a new one built. Louis Brissette still lives here today. This house is original. While making repairs following the tornado, the gambles added the enclosed front porch. This property was owned by Carl and Betty Ann Fender in 1985, who still live here today. They purchased the original stone house from Mrs. Bob Lang. This house was owned in 1985 by Ken and Ellen Bryan. They still live here today. This home was destroyed by the tornado. The new house was owned by Thelma Potter. Clinton and Irving Potter had the new home built. This house is original. It suffered major damage following the tornado and was repaired. Previous owner, Harry Dunnegy, lived here from 1918 to 1973. This home of Bert and Dorothy Groans had to be demolished and they built a new one. While I volunteered at the community center following the tornado, I heard many heartfelt stories of the destruction and trauma that people had and were still going through. But the one that has always remained in my memory is the one of the Pinckney family. I contacted one of the family members and asked them if they would write me in their own words what happened that day. The letter I received said it all. They lived it, survived it, and it's still with them today. My mom could not get to any of us to comfort. She did the next best thing. She gave us the gift of music in our hearts and our soul. We sang as loud as we could to let everyone know we were alive. We had no idea what the rest of the town looked like or if it was even there. I was told that when rescuers came down the street that day, they heard children singing, Jesus loves me, coming from the rubble that once was the house or the home of the Pinckney family on 75 Amaranth Street East. Mike Stefanik's home was destroyed. He had this house built. The barn at the back of the property is original. The Spurl house was repaired and the barn at the back of the property was repaired as well. Bob and Pat Kennedy's home was destroyed. It took the Kennedys four and a half years to reach an agreement with their insurance company before they could rebuild.
Owned by Bill and Helen Miller in 1985, this home was repaired. Truman and Jean Gilbreth had their home destroyed. They built this new home. They still live here today. Harvey West's home was repaired. Reg Carter's house was demolished and Reg built a new home. Willis Doyle's home was totally demolished. He sold his lot to Chris Callahan who built the current home. After their home was destroyed, the Kimberleys sold their lot to the Grand River Conservation Authority and it will never again be a building lot. This home of Ivydale Wells was repaired. The Gallagher property, formerly the home of Milton Stewart, was sold to the Grand River Conservation Authority and it will never again be a building lot. Bruce and Teresa West's home was demolished and a new home built. Wilbert and Myrtle Platt sold their vacant lot to the Grand River Conservation Authority, where it is now open green space. This home, owned by Alan Elliott, is original to this site. It was repaired. The maple tree in front of this house is one of two that survived the tornado. This home was built by Bill Hunt in 1992. This home of Willis Farriers was demolished, a new home built. This home was destroyed, owned by John Franklin. He sold the lot to the Grand River Conservation Authority. It will never again be used as a building lot. This home of Rose Fines was destroyed and a new home built. This home was owned by John Lamont in 1985. It suffered major damage. However, Barry Fuller bought the house and moved it to a lot at 26 Emma Street South. John Lamont built the new house that sits on this lot today. This home owned by Gord Clayton suffered major damage, but was repaired. If you see it on uh, television all the time, you think, well, it'll never hit me, these disasters and stuff like this. And uh, when you come home and see it help yourself, the thing is, you lose so much. What you've worked so hard to gain, you know, you have your nice home and everything's all set and your routine's gone. When everything goes like this, you're, you're starting all over from scratch again.
This home owned by Dorothy Smith was repaired. This house was repaired. It was in this location that Doug Hunter's aunt, Matilda McIntyre, who was visiting from Scotland, lost her life. One of two people that died during the storm. Doug and Darlene Pratt's house and barn were both destroyed. They rebuilt. Doug and Darlene still live here today. Fred and Margaret Bell's home was destroyed and demolished. This new home is similar in appearance to the one that was destroyed. Dick and Mary Sprite's house and barn were both demolished. They rebuilt. The Sprites still live here today. That ends our tour through Grand Valley showing the individual homes. We will now present some additional pictures, video, and headlines that were gathered during the making of this video. The most obvious long-term effect caused by the tornado was the loss of the mature maple trees that lined both sides of Amaranth Street. As soon as the rain stopped, the dump trucks appeared. The backhoes appeared. Uh, everything just seemed to come up. And uh, the Mennonite group appeared, and things started to disappear. Rubble was going in trucks in all directions. On behalf of all of us that sat at the arena and took telephone messages, I really would like to extend a great hand of thanks to our local people. We did it without government involvement, we ran smoothly, the cooperation, the volunteering, absolutely everything. There was no ands, ifs, or buts about it. Everyone volunteered, everyone did their part, which made our cleanup and our running of our operation absolutely wonderful in a time of devastation. The Grand Valley Fire Department was on the scene immediately. Firemen and the local residents started to search for their family, friends and neighbors. We knew that no one could have eaten dinner, so several of us organized barbecuing hamburgers and hot dogs that were donated by the two grocery stores.
This is Peter Vanderswag and Brenda Young in front of Willis Doyle's home. Here is Charlie Snyder looking over what is left of his home. On the right, in the blue blazer, is Ontario Liberal leader David Peterson. This was local MP Perrin Beatty speaking with Laura and John Wolfe. This is the Grand Valley Town Council of 1985. Top row left to right, Clerk Treasurer Les Canavet, Reeve Bill Young, Councillor Jim Irvin. Bottom row left to right, Councillor Brian Hillis, Jack Sim, and Reg Corbett. This is 1985 Fire Chief Urban Moore. The big thing is, is just the help that came in from everybody. Volunteers came in from all over and um, from all the different communities. Uh, we had uh, works departments come in and help us as well, but I think uh, uh, the, the volunteer people that just came from everywhere and the, the Mennonite community came in and were a great help to us as well. And you can't say uh, enough about the work that they did. Uh, one of the unsung heroes though was a, a guy named um, uh, uh, Carl, uh, we called him Fireman Fred, he came in from uh, Kitchener. He was there on the Friday night after the tornado. He was there for two weeks. Ray Ritchie with what's left of his Ford Model A car. This is Betty Ann and Carl Fender. The Orange Fire Department held a telethon to raise money for the Tornado Relief Fund. On the left is Veda McCrone, Senator Brian Hillis, and Councillor Jim Irvin on the right. I think that the, the town will be better in the spring once the, the houses are finished, and uh, there are I think about five lots that are not built on, but the rest has progressed pretty well and I think uh, people are much closer after what they have come through. The winter following the tornado, a committee was formed to make plans for the replanting of Amaranth Street. The members were Roy Graham, John Lamon, Elna Ritchie and Rick Taylor. In the spring of 1986, the GRCA replanted both sides of Amaranth Street. On the left is Councillor Jim Irvin and Brian Hillis cutting the ribbon at the opening of the new library in 1988. Ready. Let's go. This building is officially open. Thank you.
uh, sitting at my desk in the lower, below the library, and uh, the sky started to look almost like something I'd known in a typhoon in Hong Kong. So I decided I'd better go and get Shan downstairs if I could, where it would be a little safer. From the time, well, it took me, I guess it's about 30 feet from my desk to the back stairs. And that may be a slight exaggeration. I went, I ran over to the back stairs, and by the time I got there, the stairwell was full of bricks. So I knew Shan would not be coming downstairs. Uh, I realized right then that uh, we were in the middle of the, we were practically in the eye of the tornado. Uh, so I went outside, and this is another thing, I went outside, I took the time to open the door without looking at anything, and there was nothing up left upstairs. I didn't hear any cries, although um, in my excitement, I guess, uh, I might have been thinking of other things. I went back in and went to sit down in my seat, and sitting right in front of me at about head level was a big iron beam. So I guess it was a blessing that I tried to warn Shan about the pending storm. My granddaughter was living in the second floor of a house just straight across from me, but facing Main Street, that my wife and I owned. And she was on the second floor. The first floor was a storefront. I got over there. She was fine. Her babysitter had wrapped her in a blanket and shoved her under the bed. The house was in reasonable shape at that time. Uh, however, then I came back to my office, and at that point I heard someone saying, help me, help me, and there was about six guys up on the floor of the library throwing stuff around, bricks and everything, and they were throwing them all in my direction. <coughs> Unfortunately, I had to holler at them. To, I'd like to get in there, if you don't mind. Uh, and it turns out that there were people upstairs. And the story goes, now I, I'm not exactly sure about this, but the little Moore girl uh, was up there. I forget her age now, it's just a youngster. Somehow she'd been protected by uh, the way the lumber and things flew around her, so she had a, a protective wall. Uh, Shan would know this better than me, but um, the story is that she was sitting there looking very contented, and uh, as much to say, what took you so long, <laughs> you know? And But then I looked around the village and it was a mess, a real, real mess. Uh, the house next to me, the back wall had been sheared off, the beds were still made, the wardrobes, stuff on the dresser was still on the dresser, but there was no back wall at all. My little truck I had had rolled onto her lawn, along with all the rubble, of course. And uh, people were seemed to be running everywhere. There was hydro wires all over the place. There was water pouring at least six inches deep in front of the, the library at the hill. Uh, and uh, my daughter-in-law was working at the restaurant across, so I went to see if she was okay. <coughs> they weren't affected too badly. Uh, and I said, well, I checked on the baby, and if she's all right, and she's, oh yeah, I've been over there already. The young girl that was looking after her did a, a yeoman job of looking, keeping her protected. So I thought, well, it's time to look around the village. But I had, there's nowhere I could go because the roads were blocked. I didn't have a car. I did a bit of walking. <clears throat> the Reeve was out on Main Street going berserk. <laughs> uh, and uh, everywhere you looked, it was ruined. You know, just, things were piled high. The water was roaring all over the place. The sky cleared almost as fast as it 
clouded over. It was one of these almost instantaneous things. Uh, typhoons in Hong Kong were the same thing, they, but they were torrential while they lasted. Uh, I hooked up with Carl Hellis, who was our road superintendent, we started walking around the village. Uh, we didn't have to go too far afield from where we were because it was Amaranth Street from west to east that was the most uh, <coughs> hardest hit. Uh, the house next to us was a mess. The next house wasn't bad. Then it jumped across the street to a bungalow, Big Jim, an old railroader. Um, missed the, just chipped the bungalow next to it. The house that I owned, the two-story building on Main Street, didn't look like it had been damaged at that time, but um, further examination, of course, changed that. Then we started going east on Amaranth Street towards the river. And it seemed like every other house was badly hit and it hopped from one side of the road to the other. People were screaming and running around. Just everybody, of course, was panic-stricken. And you can well imagine why. Uh, we got um, down to the bridge, and I forget how many houses we counted. Now, at this time, I, <clears throat> I should tell you, I was the clerk treasurer of the village of Grand Valley and responsible for the role. I figured we had lost about one-third of our assessment role in that storm, which to a place the size of Grand Valley is a sizable hunk of income. Uh, it made a big difference and I had to do a bit of fighting for that later on. I don't know what else I could say at this time, but. It just seemed like the storm came, the people were there totally organized, they had this and this and this. The ladies had the things going up at the arena already, uh, accommodation for people. We were, um, I should say we, a lot of people were gathering up blankets and clothing and stuff and taking them over to the arena. How the word got around, I don't know, but they got the word around. And uh, then our three of our counselors uh, sort of organized come and go uh, traffic and stuff like that until the police came. But they were organizing, it seemed, as soon as the rain stopped, the dump trucks appeared, the backhoes appeared, uh, everything just seemed to come out. And, um, oh, I guess. I, it was the f next morning, first thing in the morning, the Mennonite group appeared and things started to disappear. Rubble was going everywhere but uh, in trucks in all directions. Anybody that had a hollow in their farm was taken in for fill for one thing. Uh, the hydro line, the main hydro line, the big towers, they were all twisted, wire everywhere. I've never seen a hydro pylon twisted so easy. It's almost like uh, a child would twist a toy or something, you know, it just... Um, there didn't appear, as I recall, to be too much panic. I think the people were more worried. What do we do now? You know, that seemed to be the main question. What do we do? And, of course, there again, that took a bit of organization. Our MP Jack Johnson was on the scene within hours, at least it seemed like that to me anyway. He wasn't long getting there. Uh, I don't know, the devastation was so great, it, it's hard to comprehend and where do you start? Every house had a, some effect, others were totally destroyed. Uh, luckily, I think we only lost one, two lives that I know of. And one was outside the village, just outside a lady visiting from Scotland. <clears throat> and another guy had stopped on the way home and then took off. If he'd have gone straight home, he'd have probably made it. He was going west on second line. 
uh, his truck was just picked up and thrown. What else can you say? It, uh, it's hard to describe that kind of devastation, to me anyway. But there was no people, the people weren't running around screaming and pulling their hair. For some reason, to me the people seemed to be so calm. You know, how can you stand there and look at what's left of your house? Uh, and that's what they seemed to be doing at that time. I guess once it sunk in, it was a different story because people were <clears throat> calling my office all the time. Uh, but the thing that amazed me, I think, the most and really impressed me was the quiet attitude of the people. No one was going around, okay, so the wind blew my house out, when are you going to build my new one? What are we going to do? People are asking all kinds of questions, usually anger. hysterical because they felt they were more important than the next guy. And uh, this didn't happen for some reason. Everybody so lined up for food, everybody stood in line and waited their turn. Uh, it was fantastic. People accept, a lot of the people accepted accommodation at the arena. Uh, that the ladies had organized. Uh, we had clothing coming in from all over the place. Food was just appearing out of nowhere. I don't know how else you can explain it. It just, the calm was almost as frightening as the storm. It was just such a dramatic opposite. Uh, usually in a, this kind of a situation, there's always a lighter side. Uh, my office was not too badly destroyed except for the piece of steel that came through where I was sitting. But one thing that struck everybody really funny, uh, the main door and it was a, a solid glass door with a bar across. The glass was long since gone. And every time I'd go out, I'd lock the door. Every time I came in, I locked it. And this became a a sightseeing thing for the OPPs. They'd line up and watch me go in and clap. Or they'd watch me come out and they'd all clap because I locked my door for one purpose. <laughs> That's it, thank you. <laughs> uh, we had visits from the government people like our Member of Parliament and the Premier with promises that restitution would be made, financial restitution, aid as it's needed, if asked for, would be made, and they lived up to their work. Everything came through that was required. Uh, my assessment role was almost balanced. Everything was fine. Well, first of all, uh, it, when it happened, I was at work at the, uh, at the old co-op store on Mill Street, and we watched it out the window and didn't really realize how serious it actually was. Uh, there was uh, there was somebody parked out front, one of our customers, uh, uh, Mrs. White, and her, her uh, baby had just left, and we looked out and there was a tree down on top of their car. And uh, two of uh, our customers, uh, and uh, Gary Whitworth, our fuel driver, Dwight Burke was one of the customers I know, ran out and right in the middle of that, grabbed them out of the car. And as it went through, we noticed how serious it was, and all the trees were uh, were, were down like matchsticks, and uh, just about uh, about 20 feet in the air. But anyway, uh, we uh, we started to, to assess the damage, and uh, I remember walking up uh, uh, Emma Street, and um, one of the the things that I saw that it, it, I'll never forget was uh, Wick Montgomery, who was the insurance agent. He was, yeah, he was shoveling out the water out of his driveway because it always, every time it rained, it always poured into his garage. Uh, meanwhile, his wife was across the street in a house getting her hair done and the house was leveled. And he just, uh, the, but everybody uh, started to jump in. And I, I don't think anybody really knew what had hit us. Anyway, uh, we were very fortunate because uh, uh, everybody came in to help right away. I remember uh, the Accioni's or Grand Valley Sand and Gravel had uh, 
payloaders in right away pulling the uh, the trees off the street so the the emergency vehicles could get down and uh, that was you know the first thing um, we started to at first set up a, a center at the school uh, we uh, and very quickly realized that um, that couldn't uh, go on there because this, the kids would be coming to school Monday morning so we very quickly changed it to the arena and uh, and that's where uh, the center was set up but the people be, uh, came in from all around and uh, and helped out and I think that uh, uh, the, the day after the tornado on the on the Saturday uh, I don't think we ever have witnessed or will witness anything like that again so we were talking about setting up the arena. Uh, we had the arena set up for uh, for a center where people could come. Uh, for mainly, we we served meals at the start, and uh, was uh, uh, Veda McCrone and Liz Taylor did a great job of uh, setting up. And uh, Millie Roy Roy was one of the original people that helped, and Millie did a great job for those first few days. Um, uh, things that happened very quickly. Uh, uh, Irvin Moore was our fire chief at the time, and uh, he's, I can't rem uh, say enough about the way he stood up when they were rescuing those kids from the uh, library that, uh, that afternoon. Uh, the, at the time, he was, you know, Irv had a heart condition, but he stood up very well there, and he's still going. So, but uh, he, uh, uh, he uh, was there, and uh, he actually arranged for some generators to come up from Summers at Tavistock, and uh, we... Uh, we had them set up. We had we had a generator at the arena to power it, uh, and I believe Bill Durkin's tractor was on it. And there was one set up at the Becker store downtown, and Bruce Gallon's tractor was on it. Uh, and there was a generator set up at Young's Food Market and over at the IGA store. Just we we thought that was important uh, that the food stores still had uh, had power because we were out of power till Wednesday, I believe, when the, the it came back on. So. Um, the other thing, uh, the other thing that uh, we did have a, a generator uh, up at the uh, River Hill su subdivision uh, to power water up there because at that time that was the only town water we had. Um, so uh, there was a tanker of water brought in from intercounty milk truck at Arthur, and it's uh, first was downtown, then we moved up to the arena so so uh, the residents could have drinking water. Um, the big thing is, is just the help that came in from everybody. Volunteers came in from all over and um, from all the different communities. Uh, we had uh, works departments come in and help us as well. But I think uh, uh, the, the volunteer people that just came from everywhere and the, the Mennonite community came in and were a great help to us as well. And you can't say uh, enough about the work that they did. And they they. Uh, uh, they came in on the Sunday morning. Uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Benninger was the head of the Mennonite Disaster Relief, uh, and he came in uh, and he was he just was in, got things set up. He put a person called Delmer Zare and uh, Alan Diefenbaker in charge, uh, and they worked with us. Uh, one of the unsung heroes, though, was a, a guy named um, uh, uh, Carl. Uh, we called him Fireman Fred. He came in from uh, Kitchener. He was there on the Friday night after the tornado. He was there for two weeks. We offered him a place to sleep at my house or other people's homes. He he stayed at the arena. Just wanted to be part of it. He he, he worked for the um, city of Kitchener and the hydro department. And he just came and um, we put him in charge of crews, going out and helping clean up. And he was there when they uh, cleaned up Casey's. He was there other places and he was just a great person and uh, um, the other counselors did a great job, uh, uh, Jack Sim and, and uh, Brian Hillis and uh, of course Bill Young, uh, our Reef, uh, you know, took this to heart and uh, he was, he was, uh, you know, I think eventually it got to Bill and he passed away a year later but uh, um, he really, uh, he really took it hard to, to see what happened to his community, but um, to see everybody come together was just uh, amazing. And uh, um, I don't think anybody can ever uh, experience what uh, community means. This is what we went through at that time. So it was, it was something that uh, we'll never forget. 
Oh, that was uh, that was something uh, being on the, the telephone that went right across the country. Uh, we were sitting at uh, there was uh, uh, Bill Young and myself and Pete Bowis, uh, who was the Reeve of East Luther, went down that night. And uh, Bill and I got on the air. Pete didn't get on, but uh, I remember right off the bat, uh, Bob got my name wrong. But uh, you know, my name is John James, so he was partly right. Eh? <laughs> but anyway, it was it was something being on the telethon and and uh you know growing up i i remember i remember waiting in the in the uh the in the lounge there to go on air and uh and uh they were getting ready to do the lotto draw and bill lawrence who was uh uncle bill uh, on the tiny talent time comes in to do the draw and i got to meet him so that was uh, something way back then so uh that's a long time ago though so or, uh, and we were we went down on the saturday night to do that telethon the week after and uh you know uh when we came home i got dropped off downtown and and uh we went in for a beer at the tavern and uh and i walked home and i just that's when it hit me walking up uh around amaran street up to my house on emma street and uh seeing the places either tore down or boarded up that's when it that well, we took a week or eight days to to finally hit me what had happened that was the hardest part pp OPP. Well, I think that uh, you know th we got to think about uh, the great job that the uh, emergency services uh, did at the time. The fire department they they were just phenomenal. The rescue. Uh, a lot of people will forget uh, that the fire department in Grand Valley they were raising money at that time uh, to build a new fire hall. They've got one since, but at that time they had raised a lot of money and uh, they donated their money that they had raised to that point to the emergency relief fund to get matching dollars uh, but the police they uh, they were another great group they came in on the on the uh bill Hanna and his crew out of shelburne uh they came in and they were here from from the friday afternoon right through and uh, the superintendent of the uh ontario provincial police he came in and he was uh, a couple of times, and I know that he gave uh, each one of the counselors one of the OPP uh, pens, and he said they're very, they're only given to special people, and that was, that meant a lot. And uh, I think about the Thursday after, um, he took us up in the OPP helicopter, and we got to see the path of the tornado, and um, it was a path cut right into the ground over it, so that was, that was something special. And, uh, but they were just great in all that they did. And, um, you know, I don't think uh, everybody will remember that the medical center actually, the roof was taken off it. And I remember cleaning out the medical center and we moved it up to the arena, into the to the board old boardroom in behind the snack bar. And uh, seeing the people come in uh, for treatment uh, the following week, and not only for bangs and bruises, but mentally too. And uh, that was um, that was pretty touching, seeing some of your strongest people um, having trouble, and I don't think we could we'll ever forget that. For 50 years, I've operated an amateur radio. In many cases, our our work is in emergency. On the particular day the tornado went through Grand Valley, I received a phone call that they needed us immediately. Two of us arrived in Grand Valley shortly after the tornado had left and it was amazing the destruction to see trees snapped half off, to see tr metal wrapped around a tree, to see a two by four through the wall of the library. It was shocking. Our first role when we arrived was to work with the OPP to, to walk the streets to make sure there was no damage done that they weren't aware of or emergency where they needed help. Early in the evening, we set up a radio station in the arena on the second floor, and for the next seven days, we operated that station. The first night we were there, we were answering questions from people in Toronto and the area, asking about their aunts, their uncles, their friends, how were they, and we were able to answer most of them with the help of the Grand Valley people that were there. But later in the evening, we realized that the farmers didn't have the equipment to milk their cows, for instance. So we spent the rest of the night, right through until after midnight, contacting amateurs across southern Ontario and asking them to find generators. And they brought them up the next night. In fact, some of them came up during the night so that the farmers could have it. 
The Red Cross come to emergencies and their role basically is to assist the people to find accommodation, especially if they've been uh, out of their homes. Well, on this particular occasion, the Red Cross didn't have a job to do because one of the amazing things about Grand Valley is they look after each other. When we were there, we found that all the people on Amaran Street had been settled into spots. People had come in from out of town, picked them up, taken them, and looked after them. And so they were well looked after. And that's one of the traits of the people of the valley. They were wonderful, kind people, and I had the pleasure of working there for four years with them. And it's amazing. Out of this tornado, out of this emergency, came something that no one really suspected would happen. There's positive in every disaster. The county did not have an emergency plan. People did their own thing that day, but they weren't coordinated. They weren't working together. So following the tornado, the county decided that each township, town, would have to have an emergency plan. After the emergency plan was developed, all the townships, Grand Valley, Shelburne, and Orangeville, put their plans together into a county plan. And out of that has come a plan of action in the event of an emergency in Dufferin County, we can spring into action. One of the other positive things was communications. You can't make decisions unless you have communication. And that's where the amateur radio operators for many, many years provided that first line communication. But now, the, all the systems in the county have backup. So in the event of an emergency, the officials, when they meet in the control center, will get first line information and be able to make wise decisions. But for me, having been there for seven days and watching the people, what really amazed me was the care they had for each other. It was amazing and there are great people in the valley. May 1985, uh, a total devastation uh, in the village of Grand Valley. However, around 4 o'clock, 4.30, it brought several of us to the Grand Valley Public School where we then made some plans and headed to the Grand Valley Community Center. My position was feeding the thousand, literally, for at least two weeks of that time. I would like to draw attention to several people from out of town. Belmore, Elmont, Ethel, Mississauga, Oakville, various service clubs, various churches, all delivering pies. The one group from Ethel delivered 200 pies one day, which, which was very helpful, very grateful. And to the Schneider's Brokers, who at that time, my brother-in-law Dave Beam, uh, headed this up. And it didn't matter what I needed. I called Dave. He did a run with all the drivers and whatever we needed. They delivered to us in Grand Valley. At that time, uh, Larry Ball, a local resident of Grand Valley, worked for Gailey Products. Again, supplied us with a refrigerated truck for at least a month of that time. So because of lack of refrigeration, which was great. We had storage for milk, bread, salads, whatever we needed was in the truck. Um, the feeding, the volunteers, uh, I just had many volunteers, lots of help. I made up a schedule, everybody followed it. When I wasn't there, there were always people to fill in and help, and that was great. We ran breakfasts for the first week starting at 5 o'clock in the morning, which I did, and a couple of other ladies for the OPP and the Hydro. Eventually, we delivered food and coffee breaks to the Hydro because it was easier for them to stay working, and we had a delivery service, which took food out to the fields, out to the roads, wherever the Hydro men were working, which was great. Our uh, other helpers, our other volunteers, everyone was fed at the community center, upstairs. We had all sorts of facilities for them, and it was great. They had a sense of friendship, a sense of camaraderie. Uh, it made their days go a little bit easier, not having to prepare food, and they could come and go for tea, coffee, biscuits, pies, whichever they wanted, all day, morning, noon, and night. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything other than that, other than a many, many thanks to all our volunteers, local, which were tremendous, all our service clubs, all our institutes, all our churches, between Grand Valley, Orangeville, Shelburne, our local people were tremendous. And we offer a great thank you to them all and to all the out-of-towners who really came from far and wide to support and give us a hand. On behalf of all of us that sat at the arena and took telephone messages, I really would like to extend a great hand of thanks to our local people. We did it without government involvement. We ran smoothly. The cooperation, the volunteering, 
absolutely everything. There was no ands, ifs, or buts about it. Everyone volunteered, everyone did their part, which made our cleanup and our running of our operation absolutely wonderful in a time of devastation. That day, uh, I do remember uh, it was a beautiful morning and uh, went to work. At uh, lunch, I remember I always went down for the mail at, the, at lunchtime and went down and uh, noticed that it was turning cool and wished I had brought my sweater with me. And when I came back, um, everything was fine, although I, I had this f funny feeling all day that uh, something wasn't quite right. And uh, I can remember uh, the, girl, the kids coming into the library after school and uh, there were uh, three children in the library at the time. There were Ricky and Catherine Moore and uh, Wilfred McLean. And they were all sitting in the children's room, either reading books. And we had um, cassette uh, players, and they were listening to stories on cassette, whatever. And uh, then um, I noticed that uh, it was getting really dark outside. It was pouring rain. And uh, Alan and Joan Cromack came into the library it would have been just before the tornado hit, and uh, and uh, they had just come in, and we said hello, and the front door of the library blew open. The door kept flapping in the wind, and it was it was a really heavy door, but it was just going like this in the in the wind, and he, so uh, we ran over to try and shut it, but there was there was we couldn't even get a hold of the door, and uh, that's when the lights started to flicker in the library, and then the. Uh, the hydro went out and it was so black that you couldn't see anything and I was trying to find uh, the children's room and I but the building was starting to shake and the windows blew in and I could feel the cold air and I grabbed onto a, a bookshelf but bookshelf was shaking so bad that I was afraid it was going to fall over on top of me which was the least of my worries I guess and then um, I was uh, standing by the front desk and something, I don't know, I was, it, was, it was just so terrifying because I had no idea what was happening and I, I just hit the floor just seconds before that uh, tornado hit the library dead on. Uh, when I came to, uh, I was completely buried in the rubble. I, uh, it was... I couldn't move at all because uh, it was it was completely I was just completely covered and I could um, I could hear uh, someone calling and I I, f I realized it was uh, Ricky and Catherine's mother who had been sitting in a car outside of the library waiting for the children and she was asking me where the where the kids were and I I told her they were had been in the children's room but of course there was. Uh, no sign of Catherine. She did find Ricky. He was uh, he had he wasn't buried and uh, he had a broken leg, and uh, but there was no sign of Catherine. And for a while they couldn't find Wilfred, but he had um, run down. His mother worked downtown as a hairdresser, and he had gone down there. It. I was um, I was buried. Well, they. Tornado hit at 4:20, I believe, and it was about 10 after 5 before they uncovered me. I had um, beams laying across my upper back and my hips, and they had to get a chainsaw to cut them to, so in order to get me out. Um, I think the worst part was was <laughs> almost being buried alive. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> It was it was just so traumatic and uh, and I remember uh, my husband and my son got there after they had they had uncovered the my my upper uh, body but I was still trapped with my hips and I I lost um, feeling in my legs because the the beam laying across my back cut off the circulation and and um, and doctor I remember. Um, before they uncovered me, too, the firemen were there, and they, they were, they kept calling at me, "Where are you? Where are you?" And I'm like, <laughs> I couldn't. I just kept, you know, yelling at them. But they were walking on top of the uh, 
the rubble and so they, they were walking on top of me and uh, the weight it, it was just the pain was incredible so um, once they got me uncovered and pulled out it was and I realized um, and I, I looked that was the first time I looked around and I realized that there was nothing left of the library I uh, they carried me across the road uh, where there was all kinds of people sitting on the lawn by the cenotaph and uh, people were were sitting there yeah you know, I mean everybody was just crying and there was ambulances and and uh, Dr. Mulder came over and looked at me and I had I had some cuts and and um, at the time I didn't know how extensive my injuries were and he and because there were so many people that were injured worse than I was, I just went, I just went home. And uh, later that day, went up to the hospital in, in Shelburne and had a doctor look at me. And that's when we found out that I had cracked vertebrae. And of course, I was black and blue from head to toe. I had to have stitches in my wrist and my my head from cuts. Um, the uh, the strange thing was too that um, when the actually it was it was kind of ironic because afterwards um, we found out that the the back corner room where we just weeded out a whole bunch of books all those books were still there and all the good ones were gone <laughs> and my purse was still sitting on my desk <laughs> so that was of course there was a lot of strange things happen like that. Uh, when they finally, uh, it took them a long time to find uh, Catherine Moore, and she was uh, obviously completely buried in the rubble as well. But when they found her, uh, they pulled her out, and uh, all she had was a black eye, and she was otherwise she was completely fine. And it was uh, amazing. Everybody, of course, all everybody was cheering, and it was um, it was really nice that they that uh, they had been able to pull her out without any any type of injury at all. The year before, we had uh, prepared a, uh, a five-year uh, renovation plan for that Carnegie Library, and we had completely uh, refinished the uh, original oak floors in the library. We put all new shelving in. The children's room had been completely renovated with new shelving and carpeting, and uh, we had built, um, it was like a porch all along one, one side of the wall with a so that the kids could sit in, it was like they could sit inside the porch and listen to stories or read books. Uh, it was all painted, completely painted, and uh, we were planning at the time for a uh, rededication or something of the all the renovations we had done, so we were planning all these special events, <laughs> and then the tornado hit and it was it was like poof, it's all gone. And uh, so that, that was kind of, that was pretty traumatic too after, you know, redoing everything and, and bringing that old Carnegie Library, sprucing it up. <laughs> so it, but we, uh, we were back in business, I think it was two weeks after the tornado, we received um, a bookmobile from the Kitchener Public Library. They loaned it to us and we worked in that uh, bookmobile for three years and it was uh, parked uh, on the Mill Street by the, uh, the, the, right on the property of the church by the post office and uh, in the winter we froze and in the summer we we roasted in that thing but it was but we were able to offer the library service in that bookmobile so it was uh, it was great and uh, Kitchener Public Library didn't charge us a cent for the the use of that so it was in June on June the 4th 1988 of course we reopened in the the new library which is a beautiful uh, little library. I arrived home from work about 4.15 the afternoon of May 31, 1985. Irvin was working at the community centre and Ron and I were going there to help him when it became very dark, windy and pouring rain. We decided to wait. The hydro went out at 4.28 p.m. In a few minutes the storm was over and we left for the arena. We drove as far as the Presbyterian Church, 
but there were, were hydro wires, branches, and other debris on the ground, so we left the car there and walked. We stared in disbelief at where the library used to be. We climbed over fallen trees and wires to get to the community center, but Irvin was not there. We, he had walked home to see if we were all right. The Grand Valley Fire Department was on the scene immediately. Firemen and the local residents started to search for their family, friends, and neighbors. We knew that no one could have eaten dinner, so several of us organized barbecuing hamburgers and hot dogs that were donated by the two grocery stores. Friday night, Bill Durkin brought in his tractor to power the large generator that Keith Gray Electric from Bellwood hooked into the power box of the community center. This created the power to operate the facilities of the community center, which was the hub of the community for the next few weeks. The co-op kept the tractor in fuel and run it steady for four days until the hydro was restored. Early Saturday morning, there was an emergency line set up in the community center. Bell designated their employee, John Ince, as liaison for the Grand Valley area and he arranged and got what was needed in telecommunications. There were so many offers of help coming into the arena that Bill Young, Reeve of Grand Valley, asked me to man the phones and organize things. Liz Taylor took over the food and served hundreds of people each day. I would take calls, record them, organize the offers of equipment and volunteers. Three of the councillors worked out on the streets with the residents and volunteers cleaning up. I would tell them of the different types of equipment that had been offered. They would decide when and where they needed the equipment. Then I would organize it. Many calls I received offered donations of food, money, clothing, household supplies, and other items, while some phone calls received were from people requiring as how and where they could receive assistance. Clothing, bedding, household supplies filled the arena floor, and dressing rooms were filled with cases of canned goods, packaged goods, and other supplies. Those people requiring assistance were encouraged to come to the arena and help themselves to whatever they needed. Many, many groups and individual volunteers from, from far away came and helped in whatever way that was needed. Cabbage Patch dolls had just come in the market and were very hard to get. We had some donated to give to the young children. A bus trip to Canada's Wonderland for the children of the families that lost their homes was donated by the OPP. After some time, the remaining supplies were taken to the old school, thanks to the Dufferin County Board of Education, and I would go there every Tuesday and Thursday evenings, some Saturday mornings, until the end of September, and open it up so the families could come and get whatever they needed. There was a Grand Valley and District Disaster Relief Fund set up with five of us on the committee. The money was distributed on a percentage of the cost of their building permits. And for major renovations, there was a maximum limit. This took over two years to complete. Twenty-five years have passed since the day that changed so many lives. New homes were built, others repaired, Trees were planted, and life goes on. While I volunteered at the community center following the tornado, I heard many heartfelt stories of the destruction and trauma that people had and were still going through. But the one that has always remained in my memory is the one of the Pinckney family. I contacted one of the family members and asked them if they would write me in their own words what happened that day. The letter I received said it all. They lived it, survived it, and it's still with them today. It was a beautiful day. The sun was shining and it was hot. Some of the children had just gotten home from school. 
They were talking with Mary when they noticed it getting dark. The next thing they knew, it was black outside and very windy. They decided to gather and go to the basement. There were seven of them in the house that day, Mary, her son, two daughters, and two seven-year-old girls and a two-year-old girl that Mary babysat. The following is the writer's own account. We never made it to the basement. Nobody. I remember the noise of the train running through our house, the screams, the darkness, the rain, then the quiet, and then the cries. I've often heard phrases like the dead of night, the still of the night, quiet as a mouse, and it was deathly quiet. When you go through the experience of a tornado that ripped your house and your life apart in seconds, then and only then have you heard a deathly quiet. Not a bird, a blade of grass, made a sound that day, that moment of time on May 31st, 1985. The cries were a blessing to hear. We'd survived. We lived. My mom and I were both trapped under the house, but we had our spirits and voice and our family. I remember us doing a voice recall to see if all seven of us made it alive and we did. My mom could not get to any of us to comfort. She did the next best thing. She gave us the gift of music in our hearts and our soul. We sang as loud as we could to let everyone know we were alive. We had no idea what the rest of the town looked like or if it was even there. I was told that when rescuers came down the street that day, they heard children singing, Jesus loves me, coming from the rubble that once was the house or the home of the Pinckney family on 75 Amaranth Street East. Within minutes of the tornado and remained until the cleanup was completed, there were about 50 officers working 12 hour shifts patrolling 24-7 for almost two weeks. Each Saturday morning, many volunteers were busy on Amaranth Street with loaders, trucks, chainsaws, and by hand, removing splintered and broken trees, hydro poles and wires, strips of tin, steel, and other debris. They went on until all the streets were cleared. The sounds that were heard those days were the sounds of chainsaws, and the running of motors, of loaders, and dump trucks. The medical center was very badly damaged, and Dr. Mulder and his staff had to take up residence in the boardroom of the community center. Staff and volunteers had the temporary medical office set up and running in time for him to keep his next scheduled appointments. The Orangeville Army cadets came on the weekend and served hamburgers, hot dogs, pancakes, and helped wherever needed. The Red Cross also arrived very soon to help and donated two truckloads of clothing and small household items. A community church service with approximately 200 people attending was held at the Grand Valley Public School Auditorium on Sunday morning. The Mennonite people came by the busloads, clearing debris from fields and streets. Residents of Grand Valley and surrounding area did not have hydro for several days. They brought the food from their freezers and refrigerators and donated it to be served at the arena. Ontario Hydro Bell Telephone Workers worked around the clock to restore services to the Grand Valley and area. Members of the public utilities from surrounding towns and villages also came to help.
People walked around this morning in this tiny, flattened town, stumbling about, staring at the sky, almost unable to believe the awesome power of the devastation from the killer storm which swept through their towns and their lives yesterday. The most devastating part of the disaster is right here behind me. When the tornado came through yesterday about 4.30 in the afternoon, churning its black tail and whipping high winds, it tore the roofs off most of these houses and left homes in just a shambles of brick and empty frames. Five minutes after the black funnel had left the town, two people were dead. Among them, 76-year-old Matilda McIntyre, a visitor from Scotland, and Barry Wood, who was killed when the truck he was driving, was picked up by the wind. He was tossed from his vehicle and crushed on the road. For the town doctor and coroner, Don Mulder, it was a medical nightmare. The first thing was the library. There was a, a child buried and a librarian buried. Then there was a death at the north, at the east end of town, west end of town, both sides, pronounced them dead. Then we had a lot of uh, serious injuries, uh, fractured hips, internal injuries, a lot of bleeding, a lot of, a lot of wounds, a lot of uh, uh, lacerations. From this aerial view, you could see the significance of the aftermath. It was a picture of tattered boxes and strewn lumber. It was almost difficult to determine if it was once a quiet residential area. It looked more like a community scarred by warfare. And I came home, the sun was shining, and I drove into town, and I saw no trees. And I just thought, where are my kids? And I saw the street where they were. And I just, I didn't know what to do. You didn't know what was going on for a few minutes. Then all the ones you could hear stuff starting to crack and fly and glass flying all over and everything else. And the terrible force straight out of hell, I guess you could say, came right down the main street and uh, tossing vans and cars around. Words are difficult to sum up this total natural catastrophe. People can tell you about it, but you have to see it to appreciate the extent to which it hit this town of 1,300 people. The human misery is the most difficult thing to accept. Years of hard work and possessions ripped away from its roots in a matter of seconds. Neighbors gathering on their lawns today to help collect possessions from splintered wooden frame houses and bits and pieces of a lifestyle shattered forever. Hundreds are homeless in this town and the damage will probably run into the millions. It'll probably take several weeks to assess the total amount of damage following yesterday's tornado. When it came through about 4.30 in the afternoon, its black winds and its tail whipped the rooftops off most of these houses and cut a swath of death and destruction for about one mile. In the interim, residents will pick up the pieces while politicians determine what financial assistance is available. I'm Gord Saval, reporting from Grand Valley. Volunteers were busy at the Arthur Curling Rink preparing food, while hundreds of pounds of donated clothing were being stacked and sorted. If you want to uh, come to the curling club, we're running a shuttle service out of here, out to the second concession of West Luther. While in the township, hundreds of volunteers gathered at the West Luther Community Centre. And then there was the backbreaking task of picking up debris from the rain-soaked fields. We arrived about 7.30 this morning here, and uh, we, uh, we had this space set up on, on Saturday. We uh, met with the, the township council to, to get it all arranged with the, the different farmers that had the disaster here. I'm not sure how many we have out here, but there must be close to 200 at the present time. <clears throat> we're going to continue on, well, until we're done, I guess. I'm not sure how long it's going to take. We're going to go east of here. We're going to get this township first, and then we're going to get east into the next township and uh, continue on over towards Orangeville. From what I see here, these tornadoes here weren't, didn't come quite down to the ground. It appears to me like that. And uh, the suction from, from a tornado will pretty well explode a building. Uh, like a take, take these barns, they're just, they just kind of explode where the, the Woodstock tornadoes, they, they were down, right down to the ground, 
and they took crops and everything. They even pulled corn stalks out of the ground. The first day it was getting people into their barns, and other barns for their stock for milking, pig farmers to get them another barn so they could feed their pigs. And now we're working on clean up and then I would hope by next week after the insurance companies have had a look at things, maybe we can start on barn walls. We've had companies from Toronto have offered their bulldozers, the conservation have offered heavy equipment for to come in and take out stumps, trees and barn walls. It's a monumental effort just to clean up the devastation left in West Luther Township alone and officials still don't know how long it will take before things are back to normal. Now over to Gord Saval in Grand Valley. Thanks, Tracy. Here in this tiny village situated along the banks of the Grand River, its residents have been working at a fever pitch for the past three days, trying to bring some semblance of order into this chaos that was thrust upon them when the twister hit through about three days ago. Truckloads of food, clothing, sleeping bags, and other emergency relief aid has been pouring in from around the province for two days now. The Red Cross from Georgetown and Acton have a dozen volunteers at the Grand Valley Community Center helping to find dislocated loved ones. Meanwhile, Dr. Don Mulder has moved his entire clinic from downtown into the arena after pilfering what medical supplies he could from a devastated medical clinic situated downtown. For the Ontario Provincial Police, it's been a hectic three days for the 50 rotating officers from the four districts. The largest problem we've had uh, was the control of traffic in the area. Uh, over the weekend on the 1st and 2nd of June in dealing with people who wanted to see just what had happened and uh, it created traffic problems around the perimeter of the area. We'll be here until um, the cleanup is uh, completed so that uh, when we leave the Shelburne detachment which patrols this area can maintain what is required. Communications has been difficult at times because of phone calls coming in uh, and plugging up the bell lines. When we established phone lines, it was difficult for people to get in and for us to get out on those lines. Uh, we've had one person from Toronto came in this morning with a $1,000 check. Uh, other people have come in with five $100 bills and $1,000 bills. It's starting off very well. Um, other work around, around the village is progressing very well. Downtown, the exhausting physical labor continues hour after hour but some progress is starting to become visible. Here on Amaranth Street, the section of town which was hit the hardest, heavy equipment is being ferried in from surrounding counties. Dump trucks and front end loaders have been working by the hour to clean up this mess. From the village of Grand Valley, I'm Gord Savell for CKNX News. It has now been six months, six months of rebuilding and recovery after the tornado that swept through our area May 31st. Tonight, reporter Steve Fisher begins a special week-long series, returning to five of the communities hardest hit by the tornado. In this report, picking up the pieces in Grand Valley. After 100 years of relative peace and quiet, it took just three minutes to change the face of Grand Valley forever. When the tornado hit at 4.30 last May 31st, about a quarter of the houses in this town of 1,200 were damaged or destroyed. The century-old city hall was cut in half. Three churches sustained extensive damage, as did many of the town's businesses. And then there were the residents, two dead, dozens injured, and close to 200 homeless. 28-year-old Mark Erskine got to his home a few minutes after it hit. This house had been built by his grandfather, and Mark and his wife had spent the past six years fixing it up. Like many residents, Mark has now left Grand Valley and started a new life in a nearby town. But he'll never forget what happened. If you see it on uh, television all the time, you think, well, never hit me, these disasters and stuff like this. And uh, when you come home and see it to help yourself, the thing is, you lose so much. What you've worked so hard to gain, you know, you have your nice home and everything's all set and your routine's gone. When everything goes like this, you're, you're starting all over from scratch again. Though. 
For those who've stayed, it's also been a long six months trying to start over. Here on Amaranth Street, new homes have replaced many which were destroyed. And most of the homes still standing but damaged have been repaired. Still, some things take a lot longer. There were close to 300 large maple trees dotting the street. Now there are only stumps. The village is still without a city hall or library. And with the three churches that were damaged in need of more work, the faithful have to go elsewhere to worship. And while there's now work for anyone in the area who needs it, in the long run, the economy may suffer. Damage to surrounding farmland means there could be less business for this village, where the principal industry is supplying and servicing farmers. Still, most of those who remain talk of a new sense of belonging. I think that the, the town will be better in the spring once the, the houses are finished. And uh, there are, I think, about five lots that are not built on. But the rest has progressed pretty well, and I think uh, people are much closer after what they have come through. They got closer. They helped. Everybody helped one another. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, and as you can see, it's come on fantastic. Soon after Grand Valley, the tornado touched down here at this plaza north of Orangeville. It's a prime example of both the fury and the random destructiveness of the tornado. Tomorrow, we'll look at the unique story of Mono Plaza and how the businesses here are recovering. I'm Steve Fisher for Total News. This is Bill Turbovich in Grand Valley on what's left of Amaranth Street. This town of historic brick houses was turned upside down in a mere 40 seconds. Residents didn't know what hit them. I had people visiting from Oregon, uh, my Aunt Mary and her sister Sarah. They've only been here one day, and the town just about got wiped out. She just saw it yesterday. This was the most beautiful little town here. Dorothy Smith and her four-and-a-half-year-old son were trapped inside their house. Their 40-second brush with death is history. But today, she sifted through the rubble of what's left of her castle beside the Grand River. Entire houses were flattened. Police blocked off roadways, trying to keep the curious away. Looting was nipped in the bud. Premier Frank Miller toured the village around noon to get a first-hand look. Within an hour, his successor, David Peterson, was crossing the river to get his own view. He couldn't be specific, but the province will provide relief. There's no uh, uh, specific fund, but uh, generally, the province kicks in on a matching basis, generally 50-50. Now, each uh, disaster can be re uh, uh, approached on an individual basis, and I assume this one is such, such devastating proportions that it will be. Uh, I do know that uh, everyone is wants to be as cooperative as possible. For Mary Fraser, death did not take a holiday. Widowed less than a year, the twister tore the roof off her house and dragged her down a hallway. A life-saving grab to a banister kept her alive. But a visitor from Scotland was not so fortunate. Tilly McIntyre was tossed to her death. I guess they didn't have a chance. They were right in the heart of it, and they just got tossed. And uh, the one lady was buried right on the, right in the roof. She was right up in the roof and all covered in debris. And the other lady was, she was thrown clear, but she was dead. She Local hydro crews say it will be days before power can be restored. They'll work round the clock until it's done. As for the families, many are still trying to contact relatives and put their lives back together. Earlier this week, there was the tragedy of the Bangladesh tidal wave. Far removed from Grand Valley, it was a disaster somewhere else. But viewing firsthand wholesale destruction leaves one feeling numb. The people here are resilient. They'll pick up the pieces and they'll build again. Bill Turbovich, Global News. Grand Valley. Since May 31st, Ontario viewers and readers have become acquainted with scenes like these, utter destruction of their neighbors' lives, the result of a series of tornadoes. Saturday night, Ontario opened its heart and its pocketbooks for Global's Good Neighbor Appeal. Hundreds of volunteers from major corporations manned telephones answering pledge calls for the 90-minute telethon. Global started off corporate contributions with a donation of $25,000, and before the evening was through, over $300,000 had been raised. When added to the Ontario government's pledge of $3 for every dollar raised, the Good Neighbor Appeal has raised over $1 million. Viewers are reminded that if they would like to contribute, they can make their checks payable to the Canadian Red Cross Society, specifying the Ontario Tornado Relief Fund, and mail it to Global TV Drive, 460 Jarvis Street, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2H5. Global will continue this appeal for the remainder of this week.
The relief fund was further aided today through Telemedia's Radiothon from Toronto radio station CJCL and fed across the country through a chain of 50 radio stations. Global personalities Bob McAdory and Martha Howlett donated their time to the cause, as did such well-known celebrities as Eddie Shack and many others. There is no total yet from the sum raised by the 10-hour program. Ontario dipped into its pockets Saturday night for Global's Good Neighbor Appeal, and it was an outstanding success. Today, Telemedia asked the entire country to chip in with its Radiothon. The variety of methods by which people continue to donate appear to be endless. And judging by rising damage figures, every penny will be needed. Bill Turbovich, Global News. And now we welcome back reporter Bill Turbovich with another story of determination in the face of disaster. Bill. Well, John, the picturesque village of Grand Valley suffered perhaps the most damage from this tornado when you take into account the size of the community. The scene was one of total destruction as the twister wiped out Amaranth Street. And when it crossed the Grand River, it flattened a house and took a life. This is the story of the indestructible spirit of Mary Fraser. Actually, our house was up for sale. Do you think anybody would buy it? Oh, we had people coming through tomorrow. <laughs> Less than 24 hours after the tornado had demolished her house, Mary Fraser of Grand Valley can laugh at the destruction around her. The twister struck so quickly that if not for a life-saving grab of a hallway banister, she too would have been a victim. As it was, a visitor from Scotland was hurled from her living room to her death on the front lawn. Yet another visitor was buried under the roof that collapsed. Everywhere on Amaranth Street, the twister left its mark. What was a picturesque community of century-old homes is now nothing more than broken wood and fallen brick. This village will have stories to tell for years to come about the children trapped in the library under three stories of brick and the supreme effort to get them out. Mary Fraser still doesn't know exactly who plucked her from the wreckage, but she's thankful. Um, well, my son was the one that went and got the help. He went up the road and some men came down and I don't even know who even lifted me out, to be honest. I don't even know the men. They just, um, one man tried to help and he knew when he touched the stuff it was maybe going to cave in, so he waited and brought some more men and one lifted the wood and the other one lifted the bathtub and I was able to, you know, like sort of, they helped me out. In less than a week, Grand Valley has transformed from a scene of destruction to one of a community on the rebound. Where just days before there was talk of taking the insurance money and running, the townspeople have vowed to stay. Um, we didn't build this house, so we feel now that um, this is going to be our own home and it's something that we're all going to build as a family, um, that we're going to stay. Before Bill and I have a little chat, I think we're going to see a grand total come up on the screen now with all the pledges coming oh, in. Oh, wonderful. We are. $181,350. Well, that's just terrific. $181,350. Of course, we'll update that, that as we go along. Bill, Grand Valley really, really took a knock. I can't believe this town. Uh, you take a look at the top of the hill and the twister came down. It missed the War Memorial, of all things. All the trees around the War Memorial were snapped off. The War Memorial stayed there. It crossed the street, flattened the library, and just kept right on going right out of town across the river. And anything that got in its path, about 500 yards wide, just mm -hmm. didn't survive. What's interesting is, though, there has been a lot of concentration on the Barry area because that's where the devastation was obviously most. But when I drove up to check out my own country place up in the hills of Mulmer, the destruction in the forest, which is not really talked about very much, the destruction of trees and everything, it seems to be so total in some areas. It's unbelievable. You take a look at trees that are maybe, you know, five to seven inches around in diameter, and they're just snapped off at about the 25-foot level, mm -hmm. and that's all there is to it. It's uh, awesome power. Hard to believe. There you go. Bill will be back again a little later in the program, but right now let's go over to Bob McAdory and some more special guests. Matt. Thank you, John. With me now are two people from Mary Fraser's community of Grand Valley. We have Reeve William Young and Councillor Jim Irvin. Gentlemen, welcome to Global Television tonight in our effort to encourage everyone to become good neighbors. Uh, Reeve Young, you were in the village, when uh, in the town when this yes, happened? Yes, uh, I have a store, a grocery store, right in the centre of the uh, main street. Mm -hmm. I was actually on the telephone when uh, it went dead and the lights went out and then there was complete darkness. And well, uh, all I could say is just all hell broke loose then. You, there was just the noise, breaking glass, and uh, it was just terrific in the main street. You couldn't see a thing. And John, you were in town when this occurred too, were you? Jim. Uh, or Jim, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. yes. Yes, I was. Uh, I was at work down on Mill Street. Uh, we were th within a half a block of the Twister. We were very, uh, we didn't realize what was going on. Uh, it was uh, just to us, and the hydro went out, it was like another, bad storm, maybe worse than others, but we, uh, 
didn't even take shelter because we didn't realize how severe it actually was. Well, nobody still can believe that a tornado roared through this part of Ontario and caused such destruction and devastation. Reeve Young, what's the attitude of the people in the town? Are they getting it together? Yeah, it's unbelievable, uh, really. The reception that we've had from the area, all of Dufferin County, and far wider has just been unbelievable. It's been wonderful. The way that we have received help and uh, work uh, and food, clothing, it's just been... Well, we're going to receive some more help tonight, gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Now, I'm going to take a stroll over here to our money pot because we have another good neighbor dropping in, Margaret McMillan of Ford Electronics in Markham. Hello, Margaret. Hello, Bob. I have a check, uh, Bob, on behalf of all the employees of Ford Electronics for $600. Oh, that's very kind. That's the, uh, these are the employees of Ford Electronics that's and all Markham. The employees. Bob, Good. We'll yes. just slip that in there. You've got something else in your yes, hand. Yes, I have, have Bob. I also have another check on behalf of the company of Ford Electronics for $500. That's so kind of the company and the employees. Thank you very much, Margaret McMillan, for being with us. Thank you, Bob. Good. You notice we have a lot of Scottish accents with us yeah. tonight. They're, they're, they're always there when the going gets tough. Thank you so much. All of you other Scottish people, give us a call now. The numbers are right on your screen, and we'd just be delighted to hear from you. Let's go back to the anchor desk and Martha. This was Grand Valley 10 days ago. Today, it's emerging from the rubble trying to return to its normal pace as a quiet farm village. Two people were killed here, and 115 remain homeless. About a dozen OPP officers remain to keep order, though they say the residents have few security problems. That we're providing traffic control, closing and opening roads for the hydro and construction crews at the present time. And uh, during the evening hours, we're just maintaining a normal patrol of the village. This was the library and the town hall. No more. Town clerk Les Canavet has moved his municipal staff into a nearby building's basement where they deal with the usual town business and the unusual. Basically just fielding questions where people are troubled and they don't know what to do or who to go to and hopefully we can direct them to the right people. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of having a shoulder to cry on. Or Les's original phone survived but some town records didn't. He says the townspeople still have to wait for hydrometers, contractors, and insurance, but they'll wait cheerfully. What still isn't functioning normally in the town? I mean, Outs outside of the town clerk, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm quite back to normal. Oh. I don't think there's... <laughs> I As one person said, the village of Grand Valley is definitely on the map now. In fact, it's become a sort of macabre tourist attraction. But the ever-resourceful residents even began charging those would-be tourists to see the destruction and raised several thousand dollars for their relief fund. Paula Lennard in Global News, Grand Valley. Same spot, same spot. Wherever you look, it's hammers and saws as Grand Valley gets down to the job of reconstruction. At the moment, most of the work is being paid for by private insurance out of the $120 million of claims approved so far. Enough money to get started, but maybe not enough to do it all. The problem is many victims still don't know how much of a shortfall they'll have. Mary Fraser is living in a rented trailer because her house was completely flattened. She says she knows her insurance isn't enough to pay her workers, but she doesn't know yet by how much. And like many of her neighbors, she probably won't know by the time the deadline for claims to the Provincial Disaster Fund arrives at the end of July. Maybe for us it might be okay, but I know a gentleman just down the road here who is still fighting with his insurance company. Um, his basement is cracked, or his foundation is cracked, and uh, he's just fighting with them. They, he wants it down and they don't want to take it down. At the Disaster Fund offices in Orangeville, they're preparing to send out the provincial adjusters, organizing the 300 claims that have been filed with them so far. According to the plans, they start work in earnest next week and hope to be sending out checks by the end of August. They know of the criticisms, but argue it's better to start now and be prepared to deal with the problem cases when they come up. One of the problems, of course, is that you have to have a cutoff date. And uh, the longer the, the pe people delay in, in putting in their claims, of course, the longer it delays the payout of the funds. 
In Grand Valley, what it all comes down to is that despite the occasional argument over claims and a touch of bitterness, there's now a sense of optimism here, a feeling that by the fall the town will be rebuilt and the tornado will be nothing more than a bad memory. Larry Jackson, Global News, Grand Valley. On Friday, May the 31st, at about 4.30 in the afternoon, a tornado ripped through this area, just east of Grand Valley, and totally devastated it. These pieces of silo came from a farm about two miles up the road. On this program, we're going to take a look at what it takes to get the power back on. At noon Friday, the weather office issued a severe storm warning that called for high winds. A cold air front was expected from the Bruce Peninsula. The thunderstorms would bring upcurrents, and the more rapid and extensive the upcurrents, the more likely a tornado would develop. Its first major system victim was the 500 kilovolt double circuit line from the Bruce Nuclear Generating Station to Milton. These transmission towers weigh 20 tons each. This is all that remains of one section of the 500 kV line from Bruce to Milton. This conductor has been unraveled like a piece of twine, and this heavy insulator has been smashed like a china cup. The first priority for the crews is to build a bypass around this area using wooden poles. It'll take several weeks before this debris is cleared up. When conductor unravels like this, it's called bird caging. On the Bruce to Milton line, the conductors have 33 strands, 26 aluminum, and 7 steel. The lines are designed to withstand a 3 quarter inch coating of ice and a 50 mile per hour wind, but not winds in excess of 200 miles per hour. The first major population center to be hit was the town of Grand Valley. The damaging winds cut a swath through the town's most beautiful section, Amaranth Street. Had the bridge crossing the Grand River been ripped away, cleanup efforts would have been twice as tough. Another major line down by the tornado was the 230 kV line from Bruce to Orangeville. Three towers were destroyed there. Minutes later, the 230 kV line from Alliston to Orangeville went down as well. And then came the blow that sent the system reeling. The tornado ripped down five towers on the 500 kV line from Essa to Clareville. These V-towers weigh over five tons each and were scattered as if kicked by an angry giant. This is the right-of-way for the crucial 500 kV line from Abitibi Canyon. It brings power from James Bay to southern Ontario. In less than 24 hours after these towers are ripped from the ground, crews have arrived from North Bay, Sudbury, Toronto and Pickering. They brought materials to repair the line as quickly as possible. Computers that monitor the flow of electricity through the high voltage lines realized immediately that the power from Bruce couldn't get to customers. Three nuclear units of Bruce were shut down and the Barry area was blacked out by the system protection scheme. Along with the destruction of the 500 and 230 kV lines, the tornado snapped rural poles and in some cases carried them for miles. Within hours after the tornado hit, crews and materials and equipment were at the various scenes of destruction. The men and the machines kept arriving from across the province. The response was amazing, but with all the help flooding into the area, vital communications became a problem. And apparently everybody's left Pickering now because all the trucks have been loaded and gone. But he figured that Tony Norm Blair Landon, the foreman in charge of the repairs along the Bruce to Milton line, spent hours just trying to solve the logistics. We've got Brad drawings, somebody else's drawings. Okay. It's all right, we've got the drawings for those circuits. Okay, we've got ours plus those. As material came in from various regions, the roadside became a central stores area. By noon Saturday, June 1st, surveyors had arrived to plot the path of the Woodpole Bypass Line. With the bypass up, at least some power could come from the Bruce nuclear units. About 32 miles northeast, the scene was similar at the down towers along the 500 kV line from Essa to Clareville. However, a replacement aluminum tower was going to be erected instead of a wood pole bypass. Foreman Jim Quinn, Alf Galloway and Wayne Hope organized their crews and materials under tremendous pressure. Against incredible odds and considering that the damage had to be cleared away before the circuit could be restored, the line E510V was back in service 
early Monday morning, June 3rd. With little sleep and physically drained, the men had put back into service a line with an incremental value of $15,000 an hour. Repairs had to be made quickly, but the conditions presented tremendous obstacles. Hydro's heavy equipment became worth its weight in gold, and employees earned every cent they were paid. People who haven't lived through a war probably haven't seen such devastation. The killer storm showed no discrimination. These three homes were demolished, while those across the street were untouched by the savage fury. Hydro's helicopters played a key role in the restoration operation. Mobilization of materials and men was essential, and when this S-58 was running low of fuel, it stayed at the site and the gas was delivered. This refueling job took only five minutes and 32 seconds. And then it was back to work, trying to get fallen conductor out of the bush. While the helicopters and heavy equipment were at the sites of the 230 and 500 kV damage, crews worked all out to replace the downed wooden poles that provided rural service. Ralph Harkey at the Orangeville area office helped coordinate that effort. Runoffs, they're in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 poles. Meanwhile, in Grand Valley, people started to take what was left wherever they were going. Some Ontario Hydro employees were torn between their dedication to the company and their personal grief. Larry White is such an employee. He works at the SATS and lives in Barrie. My wife was in the kitchen preparing supper. My uh, older son David was in the dining room looking out the window and I don't know where my daughter was and my younger son Chris was upstairs at the back of the house watching the lightning. And David saw the tornado coming and he yelled, tornado. My wife then said, everybody in the basement. They all ran down in the basement. When they got down there, they discovered that Chris wasn't there. They tried to get back out, but by that time, the, the, there was so much force on the cellar door, they couldn't open it. And so they just knelt down and prayed that uh, Chris would be saved. But maybe 15 seconds later, the pressure was off the door. They got out, and there was Chris hanging, by, hanging to the railing upstairs. That was as far as he got. He said the wind was trying to get in his mouth. <laughs> it, I, it's just a miracle that he did not go out with the uh, wind because when the wind blew open the doors, it took the roof off my house, as you can see. We just got everything that was salvageable out of the house and we put it in the garages of the fellows that I work with. Uh, they just offered, didn't even have to ask anybody for anything. It was just so, so overwhelming. The good, goodness of these people just did, made it so, made you feel that it wasn't such a bad disaster after all. By Sunday, June 2nd, the sky had cleared and it was a nice day for a drive in the country. The number of cars on the side roads caused problems for hydro trucks and the OPP. But Sunday was a turning point. The men in the field had a better feel for what was available for what had to be done. And these men, who were working in a swamp along the 500 kV line from Bruce to Milton, were literally catered to. Families in the area took it upon themselves to deliver three meals a day to the weary crews. For the men, it was a bright spot in the day that was usually wrought with problems stemming from devastation on a scale most had never seen. 48 hours after the tornado hit, Orangeville area manager Jim Feniak also saw some bright spots. We've got 200 men that have been going, working uh, for since 6 o'clock Saturday morning, and uh, the power is at this moment being restored to the villages of uh, Grand Valley and Arthur. Uh, thousands of people are getting hydro back on right now, and they're elated. I'm very proud of the crews that we've had, the supervisory people, Ralph Harkey's, the area line foreman, took hold on uh, Friday night and by uh, bedtime, midnight, uh, Friday night, we had roughly 60 or 70 men in the area uh, bedded down, ready to go to work on Sunday morning, or Saturday morning, I should say. And uh, they were on the job at six o'clock in the morning. In the meantime, we had poles coming from as far away as Ottawa, Belleville, Guelph, 
uh, material coming in from central stores. The material was all here and ready to go at 6 o'clock in the morning and people worked right straight through till uh, dark last night. The lines were going up before our eyes. I just couldn't believe it. Inside the area office, staff began calling customers and giving them the best news they'd heard all weekend. Louise Longhurst and Carol Russell were just two employees who had worked two 12-hour shifts since Friday afternoon. On Monday afternoon at the SATS, the green lights in the control panel outnumbered the red ones. Circuits were being re-energized and the work done by the crews from dawn to dusk was paying off. Hundreds of strangers had to work together in sometimes dangerous and always demanding situations and in conditions that were abominable.